as we read the scripture today, we hear David hitting rock bottom. Wikipedia suggests that rock bottom is the, the accumulation of a descent to a place where we have nothing left to lose. How on earth did David get there? Our sermon from July 29th taught about the importance of confessing our sins like David did in the story of David and Bathsheba. And while we said that God forgives our sins and we can get back on the God track, we were also acknowledged that we have to live with the consequences of those sins. Reverend Scott Hosey from the Center of Preaching Excellence reminds us that actions have consequences and when the head of a family behaves in such wanton abandon with lack of regard for others, that that may bear bitter fruit in children who go and do the same. The five chapters that separate the story of David and Bathsheba and this story were of the loss of David's son Absalom are not five episodes of Andy Griffith where the people of Mayberry and their morals <coughs> solved the problem in 30 minutes. No, if this was turned into a TV series, it would be rated TVMA for mature audiences only due to content and violence. In chapter 13, David's son, Amnon, was unable to control his lust for his sister, Tamar. And he raped her. And she was destroyed by the disgrace. And then Tamar's brother, Absalom, held on to his hate for years until he could extract revenge and murder Amnon. And then he fled to Jerusalem and lived in exile with his in-laws. Chapter 14 describes Absalom's return to Jerusalem. Exile has separated father and son for three heart-rending years. And General Joab has orchestrated this homecoming. And while David really wants his son to come back, he also denies Absalom a true reconciliation. Author Eugene Peterson counts David's lack of forgiveness as his third monumental sin. His first was the taking of Bathsheba. His second was the murder of Uriah. And his third it was his determined refusal to share with his son what God had so abundantly shared with him, mercy and grace and forgiveness. David's hard-hearted shunning of Absalom makes Absalom bitter. And so we read in chapter 15 how he rose up in civil war against <coughs> his father and David had to leave the city of Jerusalem. Chapters 16 and 17 describe David's slow descent from the throne and the power of Jerusalem through the Kindron Valley and out into the desert east of Jordan, a land called Gilead. Peterson speculates that there in the desert, stripped of his throne and power and bleakly coming to the realization that the sun, the apple of his eye, had been plotting against him for years, that he recovers his divinic life. In other words, with less stuff distracting him, he reconnects more strongly with God and finds his core becoming humble and prayerful and more compassionate. And that, in that way, well, although David is making these battle plans to reunite his kingdom, he also says, be gentle with the man Absalom for my sake. General Joab, on the other hand, has had 
no heart softening at all. And when he encounters Absalom in battle, hung in a tree by his neck, still alive, dangling between life and death and this world and the next, he does not hesitate. <coughs> Others around hesitate, but he does not hesitate. And he kills him immediately with spears and leaves his body dangling there for the other soldiers to continue the abuse. David, back wherever headquarters was, was waiting, waiting with a parent's hope, waiting and hoping that his son would be returned to him. But instead, he hears that Absalom is dead, and he moans, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I could have died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son. Rock bottom. Being a Christian does not prevent us from experiencing loss or suffering. Suffering is neither a random, impersonal fate or a cut and dried moral punishment. We're implicated in a whole world of sin. Some of that sin is ours and some of that sin is others. But it means that we're going to suffer. Now, linking cause and effect is not going to reduce the suffering, and placing blame is not going to remove the anguish. There's going to be a time when you and when I face colossal loss in our lives and hit rock bottom. A time when we are going to moan, my son and my daughter, or my mother and my father, or my love. My love. My love. There's a false idea that a person of strong faith will be stoic and not grieve deeply. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 is often misquoted, grieve not. But the full phrase reads, grieve not as those who have no hope. We grieve, but we have that underlining of hope and that one day we will be reunited through Christ. We suffer, but we're not alone. And we can yell at God like David did, out of the depths I cry to you, O oh Lord. Hear my voice, hear my cry for mercy. Each person grieves in his or her own way. And so sometimes there's a numbness, a coldness, an emotionalness. Sometimes there's frequent weeping and uncontrolled crying. And there can be anxiety and panic. There can be incredible guilt and anger. It's okay to be angry with God. Our anger will not hurt God, and God will not be provoked to take measures against us. But God's not really the cause of our anger. The situation is. It just feels better to place that anger before God. When we hit rock bottom, we're not alone. God is with us. Even when we're yelling at God, God is with us. David knew this, and so he turned to God again and again and again, writing the prayers and the poetry that we call the Psalms, expressing our yearnings in today's Psalm, like 130, out of the depths I cry to you, but also giving us those Psalms of affirmation, like Psalm 23, Lord, you are my shepherd and I shall not want. Even Jesus turned to the Psalms in the moment of anguish as he hung on the cross. Both Matthew and Mark note that in, late in the afternoon, Jesus cried out, 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are the opening words to Psalm 22. It begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. But by the middle of that psalm, the writer remembers these comforting images. Yet, you brought me out of the womb. You made me secure on my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you've been my God. And by the conclusion of that psalm, he declares, future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness. When we are so full of sorrow that we can't even find words to express it, we can turn to the Psalms and depend on those words, just as Christ did, to carry us from sorrow to reconciliation. When David hits rock bottom, he turns to his rock of salvation, which is God. He turns to God in scripture and in prayer and in poetry, releasing his anguish and finding that comfort. And so it is with us. A little faith, sorry, a life of faith, not a little, a whole life of faith is not going to protect us from suffering, and yet we're not alone. We are able to work through our losses, whether they are colossal losses, like the death of a loved one, or a pile-up of smaller losses, like a change of health, or a change of job, or finances, or moving, or new situations of living. We work through those losses with God, remembering that God doesn't send us the problem. God sends us the strength to cope with the problem. We can turn to scripture and prayer and poetry of the Psalms to release that anguish and find the comfort. And we also have our hymns. Sevilla Martin was alone and confined to bed by illness when she wrote our first hymn, God Will Take Care of You. The lyrics to Precious Lord were written by Thomas Dorsey in response to his inconsolable bereavement at the death of his wife, Nettie Harper, in childbirth and his infant son shortly after. There is a bomb in Gilead is a black American spiritual the slaves suffered the breakup of their families, the oppression of bondage, the whips and the shackles and the loss of their dignity. And they composed these songs in the fields and in the barns in words that expressed their own daily pain and their future hope. All of these songs are genuine expressions of grief, and hope in Christ that connect our hearts and make that presence of God more real to us. We're not alone. We belong in a faith community. Rabbi Krishner, who wrote When Bad Things Happen to Good People, says that human beings are God's language. God shows his oppression to illnesses like cancer, by sending doctors and nurses to fight disease. And God summons family and friends and neighbors to ease the burden and fill that emptiness. We're not victims, we are agents, able to address suffering wherever we can. When others suffer, we can be the presence of God with skin on. We can accompany them through their pain without judging, without trying to fix it with words, without um, placing blame or trying to explain exactly how God's working. We can just be there and be alert to another person's needs. 
the Apostle Paul taught that Rome, in the Romans that nothing can separate us from God's love. Not death or life or angels or rulers or present things or future things. Not powers or height or depth or anything that's created. Paul says rather, in these things we win a sweeping victory over through the one who loves us. In the words of Nancy Tillman, from the children's book that we read at, the, read at the beginning, if someday you're lonely, or someday you're sad, or strike out in baseball, or think that you're bad, just lift up your face and feel the wind in your hair. That's me, my sweet child. My love is right there. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved. God walks with us through our sorrow. God works through us to help others. And ultimately, God will deliver us. When we hit rock bottom, we can depend on our rock of salvation, our God. Amen. Amen. Amen.